Hey, Riveters. Uh, I'm excited to see all of you again today, and I hope that you've had an amazing time building, experimenting, and problem solving with all of your STEM projects these past four weeks. Uh, we really do look forward to continuing to explore STEM with you in the years to come. There'll be more and more projects down the line. Um, but I am particularly excited to be here to virtually introduce today our guest speaker and our STEM role model, Captain Kay Heyer. Um, you've all had the opportunity to explore Captain Kay's biography with your instructors and prepared some questions based on what you've learned. Uh, today, Captain Kay will share all about her experiences as a Navy pilot, a space systems engineer, a scientist, and a NASA astronaut. And then at the end of her presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask her some questions. Captain Kay, I want to extend a huge thank you on behalf of Rosie Riveters for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, we are joined by a group here of participants ranging in age from five to 14, many of who are from military connected families. Uh, and over the past four weeks, they've explored a range of STEM subjects and persevered through complicated project builds. Um, and our incredible Rosie Riveters instructors who are in the back somewhere, <laughs> um, who are also military connected, um, have worked with them to inspire their, we can do it attitude <laughs> towards many things that, you know, many projects that can sometimes feel daunting. Um, you've counted many firsts in your incredible career and I cannot think of a better role model to capture the spirit of, we can do it. So without any taking any further time from participants, I'm going to turn off my screen and give you the proverbial floor and just thank you for sharing your time with us. Well, thank you and good morning, Riveters. How are you? Good. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, having me join you today. Uh, this is actually a really treat for me as well. I'm very proud of all the work that you've been doing. And I'm happy to join you today and share a little bit of my experience. I grew up about six hours west of you driving time over in Mobile, Alabama. As a little kid, I spent a lot of time on the beach, in the water, in around the water, swimming, surfing, fishing, sailing, loved everything about the water. And so as a little kid, I thought, maybe I might be interested in being a marine biologist when I got older because I was always very curious about all the sea life in the water. So I, I thought about that and uh, continued in school and was very interested in math and science type STEM courses. And along the way, I also watched when I was really young, I watched the Apollo astronauts go to the moon. And that just fascinated me so much. I remember just looking at the moon from my backyard and just picturing those astronauts doing their exploration on the surface of the moon. And I thought for sure when I was that age, because technology had advanced so quickly, surely by the time I was an adult, everyone would be flying in space. Well, didn't quite happen like that, but I continued on in my studies through grade school and high school, studying uh, math and science, but also all the other subjects as well. And along the way, uh, an opportunity opened up that had not existed before. They started allowing women to attend the US Naval Academy. So I was asked if I was interested and uh, I thought Navy, ocean, water, everything to do with the water, I thought, Oh, that seems to fit. That does seem very, very interesting to me. And so I had the great opportunity to join the second year at the Naval Academy to admit women into the, the uh, brigade of midshipmen there at the Naval Academy. So while I was there, I also had the just tremendous opportunity to uh, be on the sailing team, the competitive sailing team to include racing the 44 foot sailboats out in the Atlantic Ocean. For me, that was just a wonderful experience and I'll always uh, treasure that time with the crews that I got to, to sail with there. But uh, along the way, I had to decide what I wanted to do with my Navy career and I selected flying. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now because I do have a, a picture I can show you. 
and it's right here coming up. There we go. So I was flying the P3 aircraft. That's a four engine turboprop. The Navy's not flying that one anymore. They've replaced that with the P8, but one of the squadrons that I flew with in the Navy was right there in Jacksonville at the Naval Air Station, Jacksonville, Florida. So uh, some of you might be a little bit familiar with that. I was so fortunate to be assigned to a squadron that flew all over the world. At that time, women were not allowed to fly the combat missioned aircraft. So we had uh, some P3s that were gathering data about the ocean, which was very important to the Navy. We needed to know the temperature, the density, the salinity of the water, and even the ambient noise that was going on from all the sea life and just the flow of the tides in certain areas of the ocean so that uh, for military purposes, we would have that background information and be able to help find submarines if we were looking for them, if we knew that background information from the ocean. So I was very fortunate that I was so interested in the ocean and there I was flying oceanographic research missions right alongside the scientists all over the world. In three years, I got 1,500 flight hours and flew to 25 different countries all over the world. What a great experience. I later served as an instructor for several years, then decided to leave active duty Navy and go and serve in the reserve part-time and was assigned there in Jacksonville again. But it was part-time, pretty much your classic weekend warrior. And I went to work for NASA down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And in Florida, I worked on the space shuttle and I kept getting asked the question, well, hey, have you ever applied to be an astronaut? And I started thinking about it. And I remember that as a young child, I thought everybody would be flying in space by the time I was an adult. So I did not have to go aspire to be an astronaut, but things had slowed down. so. Then I started looking at the requirements to be an astronaut and what the job actually entailed. And I realized this was something I could do. So I started applying and I was so, so very fortunate to be able to be assigned as an astronaut, start training and was able to fly two missions in space. So this picture I'm showing now is me with my first crew, the STS-90 crew as we're in our orange pressure suits and we're walking out towards the launch pad to go launch into space. I flew two different times, uh, which was just a wonderful experience. The first time I flew research, a scientific research mission that was studying the effect of the brain and the central nervous system in the microgravity of space. And on the second mission, I helped install node three and the cupola, which is a whole extra room and a big, huge window installed onto the space station. Here's a picture of the International Space Station. And we basically helped towards the final part of the assembly of that station. That's a pretty big structure that's flying around in space. It takes only 90 minutes. That's an hour and a half for it to go totally around the world in one orbit. And that span across those solar arrays there is about the size of a football field. The inner part where the people live is about the size of a five bedroom house. But I mentioned the cupola that I installed and here's a picture of me inside that cupola and you see through the windows, the clouds that are floating way below us as part of the atmosphere over the surface of the earth. Well, I have been so fortunate to have these experiences. And one of the things I learned along the way was these opportunities come to you sometimes that didn't even exist before. So one of the things I like to recommend is that you build a good, strong background in your STEM courses and your STEM subjects, but also all the courses 
so that you'll be ready to raise your hand and volunteer and try these new experiences when the new ones come along. And how do I know new experiences will come along? Well, look how much the space industry is growing right now. Let me show you what just happened on Thursday. This is the Boeing Starliner rocket. At the very top of the rocket there is that capsule. And then there's the picture of what the capsule will look like in space. And that is a new way for astronauts to travel to the International Space Station. That Starliner will launch as it did on Friday or uh, Thursday evening, just this uh, couple days ago. It will launch uh, this Starliner capsule, will be able to carry astronauts. Now, this flight that just happened this week was a test flight to make sure everything's okay before we actually put astronauts on board. But it did have a crew member. And her name is Rosie the Rocketer. How about that? You may know something about Rosie. Well, Rosie is a test article, something like a crash test dummy, but she has instrumentation all over the mannequin. But you'll also notice she's wearing the Rosie Riveter bandana and her name tag even says Rosie but she is in the commander's seat on the Starliner. And she's now docked in that Starliner, docked to the International Space Station. And later on this morning, the crew on board the space station is gonna open the hatch and be able to unload about 800 pounds of cargo that was brought up to the International Space Station. Since they did not have crew members on board, they used the opportunity to bring some extra experiments and some cargo for the crew on board the space station. So keep your eye out for news about Rosie the Rocketer. And this was the ride that she had. Quite a, uh, quite a scene there when the uh, Starliner lifted off on Thursday evening. We also have another flight that's going to come up that I'd invite you to watch for. NASA is going to be launching the Artemis rocket probably uh, sometime in August. So stay tuned for that. The Artemis rocket is huge. It's, it's the rocket itself is called the Space Launch System and the capsule on top where the astronauts will ride is called the Orion. This rocket's going to go all the way to the moon and come back. And once it launches from Florida, if the weather's right, you'll be able to see it in the Jacksonville area as it goes past you. So, so stay tuned for that. And then that mission will last about six weeks. And again, this is a test flight, so no crew members on board yet. But once we get everything all tested and we're sure it's safe, we'll be able to put crew members on board and take them all the way to the moon and restart our exploration of the moon so that's an exciting time let me tell you about how you can follow along you can fly your name to the moon there's a website and ms greer will be able to share this with you as well that you can send your name in and your name will ride along on that artemis rocket all the way to the moon also you can be a guest for the launch, a virtual guest, by signing up to the virtual guest program. And again, Ms. Greer will share these websites with you. So I'm just so happy to share all this with you at this time because it's a very exciting time in space. And if you are at all interested in space, there will be opportunities for you. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, well, only you know astronauts are involved in space no there are thousands of people that are involved with each and every one of these space missions to make sure they are safe and successful everything from of course scientists and engineers but we need attorneys to make sure that all the contracts and all the policies are accurate we need accountants to help us with all our budgets and make sure all the bills get paid so that we can 
launch these spacecraft. We need people that know about food because we have to make sure and develop the types of food that we'll be able to carry on the space missions. Uh, we need folks to help us take photographs and design logos. So we need artists, attorneys, we need accountants, we need all types of skills involved to make these space missions safe and successful. So again, if you're at all interested, keep your eyes open for opportunities that may not even exist right now, but will open up for you in the future. And you'll be able to participate if you raise your hand and say, I'm ready to go and join in. So one more thing to share, and that's if you've never seen the space station with your own eyes, it's easy to see you don't even need binoculars. There's a website called Spot the Station, and here I've pulled up a, a few opportunities for you to see if the weather's good, clouds will block the view, unfortunately. But again, we could share these with you as opportunities to see the space station. If these days and times don't work for you, you can just keep checking the website to see when it goes by. Because when the sun shines on the International Space Station, that's how you see it, it's actually the second brightest object in the night sky, second only to the moon. So thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to taking your questions. Um, so I'm just gonna call on some hands that raise their hand, and we'll try to go from like a different ages to get you a, a diverse group of different, different questions, okay? Sure. How about we can start right here? How did you get to outer space? How did I get to outer space? Well, first of all, um, it took a lot of years uh, on my part for studying and applying to be selected by NASA. Uh, one of the recent selections for astronauts, 18,000 people sent in their applications and they only picked 12. So that's why I say I feel very fortunate to be selected as an astronaut, first of all. And then I trained for several years. And in my experience, I flew on board the space shuttle that launched out of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Showed you the picture earlier of that launch. And the first mission uh, just stayed in what we call low Earth orbit, only about 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. So we really don't call that outer space, but it's definitely in space because we are outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, so I was selected to fly on those missions, spent several years training for them, flew on those missions, and my experience on those missions, each one of them, the first one was about just under three weeks, and the second one was about two weeks long. So it's quite a ride. understand that what's ambient noise ah so earlier i mentioned that we were studying uh, things in the ocean and ambient noise is the background noise for instance uh there in the room that you're in maybe you hear the air conditioning going but in the ocean you actually hear these really cool sounds like you can actually hear shrimp they kind of snap they make this little snapping noise and you may even hear a whale in the distance. So the the typical noise that's going on all the time is what we call ambient noise. How complicated is the engineering behind the rockets? So I'm having a hard time hearing the questions. So maybe if somebody will repeat them for me, then I can hear. How complicated is the engineering behind the rockets? Ah, yes. The engineering behind flying in anything in space is actually very complicated. But if you break it all the way back down, it goes all the way back into our uh, basic scientific equations. For instance, F equals MA, which is force equals mass times acceleration. Becomes a lot more complicated with a rocket because the way that you overcome the force of gravity that's typically going to hold you down on the surface of the Earth is you expend a whole lot of mass really fast. That's the propellant 
that comes out that nozzle at the bottom of the rocket that provides the thrust force that pushes the rocket up into space. But then you got to make sure you're pushing the rocket in the correct direction and have the ability to correct uh, your direction. Don't really have quite a steering wheel, but we use a lot of computers to help us with all the complicated um, math. So it seems like it might be uh, very, very complicated, which it is, but we have a lot of tools with the software and the computers that help us resolve all those complicated equations. All right, thank you. Did you hear that? I think I heard how big are the craters on the moon? Is that right? Yes. So um, the moon is very interesting because it's different than the earth. The moon has no atmosphere. So here on the earth, we have an atmosphere and we get weather, we get wind, we get rain, and we get all these things, maybe even tornadoes and hurricanes, hopefully not. But these things kind of move things around on in the soil and the surface of the earth. But on the moon, when something hits it, like a meteoroid or something like that, comes and strikes the surface of the moon, because there's no wind or rain or anything, it leaves that impact crater. So we've seen on the rocks that the Apollo astronauts brought back from the moon, we've seen little craters, if you will, as small as just teeny tiny little ones that you almost need a microscope to see up to the size on some of these impact craters on the moon are just miles and miles, potentially hundreds of miles across. For instance, the largest one is down at the south pole of the moon, and the Artemis program eventually plans to go explore that really huge crater on the bottom of the moon. So quite a range of size of the craters on the moon, and we definitely want to go explore them. How about you? Would you like to go explore some of the craters on the moon? Yeah. I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Let's see. Can we get somebody in the third to fifth grade class? Anyone else have another question? Go ahead, maybe you're in the class. No. Okay. Um three five and you're in the Did you hear him? So we'll have to uh, repeat that one. Sorry, I couldn't hear it. What do you do in your free time in space? When you're in space, what do you do in your free time? Ah, that's a great question. Thanks so much for asking that one. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, think astronauts only play in space because when we're working, we don't usually have a lot of time to pick up a camera and take pictures of ourselves working. So when we have free time, we definitely grab the cameras, get pictures of each other, no kidding, play with the microgravity of space, play with our food, let it float around, chase it, whatever, uh, do all kinds of great gymnastics that we could never do on the surface of the earth uh, because we're floating in the microgravity of space. But our biggest fun thing to do in space is look back at our beautiful earth because we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour when we're orbiting in the space station. And so that's just under five miles per second now it doesn't go by like that fast but it's it's going by you know about like that so if you see something interesting you have to kind of stop and focus because it's going to be gone pretty quick but that also means that your scenery the view out that cupola out of all those windows is constantly changing and it's beautiful all right i think we have one more question and we're going to go to the oldest group Back to the oldest group, go ahead. You gotta talk really loud, okay? When you plan a mission, how long does it take to go through with the plan? So uh, I think I heard uh, how long after we plan a mission, how long does it take to execute that plan? Yes. Okay, great. Um, it depends. Uh, sorry, I don't have a more specific answer, but the minimum is several years. Because, um, first of all, there are a lot of experiments, a lot of scientists on the surface of the Earth that would like to have their experiments in the microgravity of space. It's a laboratory, 
But the unique thing about the laboratory on the International Space Station, for example, is that you don't have the effect of gravity. So for instance, if we're growing some protein crystals, they grow very three-dimensional because they're not being pulled down by the force of gravity. So we can study them better. And so that's uh, an important feature. And each experiment that's submitted though has to be evaluated is this you know is this going to be a good benefit is it something we can actually do safely with the crew on board on the international space station so sometimes these scientists wait for years to get their experiments or even their their cubesat type small satellites flown in space and then once they get lined up in the queue, then we have to plan where is that going to fit in to the what we call the manifest, which is basically the schedule. So it could take a, a minimum of, say, three years up to 15 years or so to finally get a mission uh, to happen. And of course, the biggest reason it takes so long is we have to make really sure it's going to be safe and successful. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Sure. It looks like we have like four minutes, you think? Sure. Okay, let's see. Um, do any of our instructors have a question? Okay, I'm gonna let one of our teachers ask. Okay. Hi. Um, so in the third grade class, we made a biomechanical can that can grab things um, uh, on its own. In space, what type of biomechanical objects do you have? I uh, think I heard uh, asking about um, in space, what type of biomechanical type of objects that we have. Uh, we have flown uh, several different experiments. Uh, we actually have um, a type of a robot that acts as an assistant to the astronauts because we only have so many astronauts on board. Right now we have four astronauts and three cosmonauts on board the International Space Station. And a lot of times they're assigned to do a, a project by themselves and it might be nice to have a helper. And so we've actually had on board um, a robot that can say hand you a tool when you need something or hold on to something while you need both of your hands to do something else. And we've been uh, testing that to see what are better ways to use that. And then in general, uh, one of the biggest things I got to use this is we call it the robotic arm. And that is a, a big long arm that I use to grab the node three and also the cupola out of the space shuttle and reach it up and attach it to the International Space Station. And that's a very, very handy tool. And we're always looking for better ideas. So maybe some of the riveters there can come up with some ideas for more uh, biomechanical and robotic tools that we can use on some of these future missions.